Um, hello, everyone. It is my great pleasure to introduce today uh, Frank McSherry. Frank is actually a graduate uh, of uh, UW. He graduated from here in 2004. Uh, then he went to Microsoft. Uh, and here he invented, among, among other things, differential privacy, with which he just got a good prize uh, this year. Um, he, uh, since he developed differential privacy, he actually developed a system that implements differential privacy for things. It's one of my favorite data system that can very differentially, in a differentially private way. Then he moved on to uh, real databases, and he, uh, um, like he, was, he participated in the NIA project at uh, Microsoft Research. Uh, he's now actually a traveling uh, scientist, if I can be quite correctly. He has a lot of fun uh, taking kind of the best papers that explore with data, big data processing of 100 or 200 servers. And he showed that he can do the same thing uh, twice as fast on his laptop. I think he has a very good laptop. So <laughs> let me to that. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, yeah, we were chatting about whether I could possibly flip my laptop for $100 million, but. Um, this is not to be, I think. Uh, so Dan, I got one thing slightly incorrect. I uh, actually went to Microsoft Research and then two years later graduated from here. Um, so it was a, a slight screw up, it turns out. Um, but but uh, but otherwise, uh, hooray. And I had no idea that you liked you liked Pink so much. If, had I known that people liked it, I might have kept working on it. Um, so uh, the plan the plan is to tell you about work that I um, have been doing and is continuing uh, to work on in large-scale data processing. This is, in some sense, a spiritual continuation of the NIAID work that we did uh, at Microsoft, which I'll, uh, if you're not familiar with, I'll try to get you a little bit up to speed on, though the specifics of that project aren't going to be as important. I'm going to take a little bit of a different narrative uh, approach to this. Um, a different approach uh, is going to be to tell you about data flow programming in uh, the Rust programming language. How many people are familiar with Rust? Anyone? Some? Hey, good. OK. So this is a, just an interesting programming language with a few fun properties that I think make it especially suitable for systems programming, and in particular, data-driven systems programming. I'll try to point out the reasons that I uh, that I think so as we go. And actually, this is sorry, that's this slide should have been up while I was while I was talking. So let's uh, let's get some some context and some motivation. And, and Dan Dan sort of ruined this a little bit. Not ruined. I mean, you know, you got you hopefully got you excited about this. This is this is an old result now. Um, um, I'll have my revenge on Dan in just a moment. Uh, uh, an old result from uh, from Berkeley in 2014, OSDI paper that has a bunch of different systems doing 20 iterations of PageRank on their graph processing infrastructure on a few different billion edge graphs, taking numbers of seconds that are in the hundreds. And uh, when the paper came out, you know, the reviewers, presumably the readers, were all like, "Ah, huh, neat. You know, good. I good, probably, right? I mean." You know, not as good, and then things get better. So that's so that's great. Um, but no one asked sort of I think fundamentally simpler questions like what happens if you write the ten lines of code that are a for loop that you know for i equals zero up to twenty does a page rank step. Um, what happens? And so we did that, and it turns out that things uh, you know are just a lot simpler. I mean, a billion edges is, is a few gigabytes. It's not a lot. It fits happily on I don't have it here anymore, but my cell phone. Um, you know, I have an iPhone. It, all of these graphs fit on every iPhone that Apple will sell you. Uh, they also fit on my laptop. Laptops will faster. Um, and this, unfortunately, so this, this uh, you know, the 2014 result was a little old, and I'm going to be careful here now. But the, uh, as recently as a week ago, uh, the Sigmod best paper went to a system that is three times slower than my laptop at doing graph connectivity. So it, it's still a thing that people need to, uh, need to get driven into their heads that raw performance can matter. And it matters because when you're building scalable systems, um, until you actually show performance that's better than a single thread, it's unclear whether you're actually scaling and parallelizing real computation or whether you're scaling and parallelizing the overhead that your system introduces. And it's not so, you know, if you have some miserable serialization infrastructure or something like that, the fact that you can make it go faster by adding more computers isn't, isn't something to celebrate. Uh, it's just something we shouldn't have done in the first place. So uh, this was a lot of fun. We, I, you know, gave a bunch of talks and it was very smug. and. Uh, People sort of give a little bit of implicit feedback about why don't you be a slightly more useful person and try to actually help make the systems better. Um, and so that's sort of what I'm going to walk through today, which is the timely data flow system that's sort of this continuation from NIAID where uh, we've rebuilt a few things in Rust, um, tried to make them a bit more approachable and, and pleasant to use, and ultimately you know, results in systems that, that run a fair, bit, uh, a fair bit faster. 
And in a lot of ways are just, in, in my personal experience, sort of easier to use, easier to make high performance data flow computation uh, in them. So that's what we're gonna do. Um, so, got a fun little animated bit here. So uh, timely data flow, there's gonna be a few things in the stack that I'm gonna talk about over the course of the talk. Uh, timely data flow, which you can sort of, if you squint your eyes right, it's a bit like an operating system for data parallel compute. We're gonna be looking at a layer with something that provides some, some sort of core services. Um, it lets you move data around and it gives you some coordination primitives, basically, but it doesn't make a lot of um, particularly judgmental decisions about what you need to send to whom or what the meaning of the data you send is. It just lets you move data around and quickly um, uh, quickly coordinate when, when necessary. Below this, I'm gonna probably not talk about this at all, but there's a, a really delightful serialization framework. It's in, the typo is intentional. This was, uh, when I explained it to someone, this was their reaction to it. Um, it's uh, basically, if you think about taking a strongly typed language and using mem copy everywhere, uh, you get this. And if you use the right language, it actually works too, or until the authors spec out what undefined behavior is in Rust. But uh, for the moment, it works and it goes really fast and hooray. What I will tell you a bit more about is a layer on top of timely data flow called differential data flow. And this is a slightly more opinionated version of uh, of a data flow system. It's a bit more like a, a DBMS on top of an operating system. It, it has opinions on what the records should look like and should mean. And when you start sending changes around in the data flow, what should happen uh, in, term, in forms of computation. Um, and finally, I, I won't give too many examples of this, but the, the picture is important. Um, on top of this stack, uh, you can throw various things in like cool applications. But the, the important thing that I've tried to call it visually here is that the way we built this, each layer of the stack has the potential to expose lower layers below it. So if you need to write, if you want to write a differential data flow computation and occasionally tap into the timely data flow layer below, you can. Right, so we're not trying to do a full vertical here that, that makes your life complicated if you want to work around it. Um, as appropriate, you can pick and choose from the, the different layers. And this can be really helpful because it means you don't have to go and reinvent things. Um, if there's something that's missing from this layer that you need, you don't need to build a new system and write a new OSDI paper. You can just write the 20 lines of code that tap into the, the slightly lower level. So that's good. I've written the 20 lines of code several times and I don't wanna have to write the associated papers. So, uh, so starting out, I'm gonna tell you about timely data flow. And I'm gonna try to keep this uh, not too, uh, too complicated, uh, mostly just to try to get the architectural uh, position out there. There's a few important decisions that we made that other people didn't make, possibly for good reasons, possibly for bad reasons. We'll be able to talk about that, uh, talk about that later. I should have said, by the way, anywhere you see URLs, all of this stuff is, is open source, you know, is uh, MIT licensed, available online. You can grab 100% current stuff, which means it's usually broken, but uh, yeah, it's, it's all out there. So let me show you uh, uh, an example timely data flow program. Uh, this is written in Rust. Um, there's not, there's not a lot to it, which is sort of nice. Uh, you know, you don't need to necessarily write a lot of symbols, but let me walk you through each of each of various regions of this. Um, so there's this whole pile of code, which the programming model in timely data flow is a sort of SPMD style of, of a single program, multiple uh, data thing. You write, you write one program, one binary, that you then hand out to a few different computers. And each of these computers are gonna do the same thing. Um, they're going to, run the same program, and they're gonna collectively participate in some larger data flow computation. The next level down, um, when you think about what actually happens inside the program when you start it up on each of these, on each of these machines, each of, the, uh, each of the instances of the program that you start up have some sort of like per process logic. Uh, so this is something that starts up and says, I'm, I'm gonna participate now in a data flow computation. Um, and almost always this is pretty boring and just shells into the, the timely, uh, timely infrastructure here. But you have the opportunity to do per process logic, like loading up resources if you want, pulling in some data if that's appropriate to do at a per process level. And then the real uh, parallelism, the data flow data parallelism shows up um, inside this, uh, this little timely hook here where we're essentially, we start doing a per worker logic. So we're thinking of a, of a world in which each process is going to spin up and sort of start, you know, as many workers as it has cores on the machine or something like that. But so, some number of, of independent workers, if, if you're an MI, uh, MPI person, these are like ranks. Um, MPI people, anyone? No, cool, all right. So lots of, lots of workers doing essentially identical bits of work differentiated uh, by what data they are supplied as input. But otherwise, you know, identical logic computation 
uh, just potentially different data. In this case, it's the same data. So let's just, you know, we walk through the program a little bit just to get a feel for it. Uh, it's all, uh, you know, in the spirit of language integrated queries, if you're familiar with those from C Sharp, you know, the, the goal is to give you the look and feel of the host programming language, in this case Rust. You can start at any point from standard Rust iterators, which are just bits of code that return things as you as you tug on them. You know, it's a good source of data if you're writing a data parallel system. And there are then uh, adapters which go and take Rust iterators and, uh, in a sense, ingest them into the data flow computation. At this moment, once we've once we've called this, the the system, the timely data flow system, uh, across all of the workers and across all the processes, now have uh, a common frame of reference for talking about this distributed stream of data. Um, yeah, Paul. Shoot. So what's the zero up to ten? What's the oh, I'm, I'm sorry. It's zero. It's the number zero up to ten. It's sorry. Yeah, that's a good point. This is zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. What? Why? Uh, that's what it, in Rust, that's what uh, it is. So you just I'm have sorry. 10 copies of something? No. Uh, no, sorry, this is literally just 10 numbers. Oh, you're just, It's, okay. it's a super boring, uh, this is not big data yet. Sorry, okay. we're gonna, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, this is something, in, in principle, this could have been, you know, like, open up, uh, you know, a local file with a, a gigabyte of data in it and, and munch all that data and then feed that into to a stream or something like that. Yeah, sorry, this is just, uh, fair enough. Also, another another slightly weird thing about this example is each of the workers are going to have exactly the same set of zero up through ten, which is sort of stupid. I mean, it's you know every you know you like to give different workers different pieces of data so they do different things. Right now, they're all going to do the same thing. That's that's kind of kind of silly. But um, so just sorry to get back on on message. Um, so stream is where we start building a data flow graph. This is where uh, in the context of of the timely runtime, we identify a source of data that all workers can be like, ooh, great, you know, we each have a copy of this, um, you know, we each have our own local fragment of the data associated with them, and we can start working with it. We can start doing data flow operations keyed off of this, and in particular, in this case, we go and invoke the exchange operator, which is this sort of core timely operator, which just says, I'd like to take all the data, I'm, I'm a worker, I'd like to take all the data I have, my local self, and shuffle it out between all of the other workers in the, in the system, and the way it works is you give it a, a closure, which for each piece of data that it looks at, it's supposed to return back an integer, and we make sure that all of the records with the same integer go to the same worker. Um, roughly, think of this as taking the number mod the number of workers, and we sort of route the data to that, to that worker. At this point, something arguably interesting has happened, which is that whereas we started with zero through 10 on each of the different workers, now worker zero probably has a whole lot of zeros, Worker one has a whole bunch of ones. Um, worker 11 might not have anything. Uh, but we've, we've moved the data around a little bit in our, in our data flow graph. And we're now in a position where, although we might continue with the same program, you know, we're, we're just gonna look at the data next, it's not super exciting. The workers will each do different things. Uh, or they have the potential to do different things. And that's the last thing there. And you know, so inspect just calls whatever, whatever code you give it on, on the records and you know, if you want to write stuff out to, to disk, great. It, this hasn't been a particularly brilliant computation that you needed my help to write, right? I mean, this, um, but it's meant to be sort of simple and pleasant. Uh, Dan. And should this go? Yeah, good question. Um, I know what it is. Um, let's see, what's the right way to explain it? There's basically, in, in all of this data parallel, data flow stuff, you need a, a hook to the context in which you're executing. So if you think about it as like a data flow canvas or something like that, there's, um, you know, when we say we want to take this this Rust pile of data and turn it into a stream, where you know in in, in what data flow context? And so this is a, a concrete handle to that. In principle, we could have a few of these floating around. Uh, we could have a few different independent data flows that we're assembling that are not uh, connected or nor connectable. Um, you know, you're submitting one to my server, and and Paul is submitting an independent one to my server, and I need to remember and keep track of which one I'm supposed to shove all the data at. So it's just, it's an explicit way to get a handle to the canvas, data flow canvas that you're working with. Um, I think that's, ingestion is the main place that it comes up, though we might end up seeing it again when we do iteration. Yes, okay, sorry, there are a few questions and I didn't notice who raised their hand, uh, but over, yeah, over there. Uh, so what's the difference between nx and x? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, if, if, you're, if you're not familiar with Rust, uh, the ampersand is a, is a great source of stress um, for, for people. Um, to a first approximation, don't worry about it. Uh, 
to a slightly more advanced approximation, it's uh, indicating that this method takes a reference to the data, it does not take ownership of the data. Uh, and that's an important part we'll get to in just, in just a little bit about ownership in Rust and how it clarifies, as we move data around, it clarifies uh, who owns the resources of the data that we're moving around. In this case, it's really boring because we're moving integers around, but if you're moving around strings or more advanced ADTs that had owned resources under them, this is explaining that exchange does not take ownership of them, it just gets to look at the data and then produce uh, an integer. So another question, yeah. This uh, map group by PE and reduce. I don't think there's, there might not even be a group by anywhere in it or a reduce even. So exchange, I mean, it's not, I, it's much less sophisticated than group by, for example, right? It's, it's not even, although it happens to co-locate them at the same worker, uh, so we shuffle the data around, it doesn't put them in a convenient bundle for us to look at. There, there will be operators that we'll get to that will look more like map and reduce for sure, but this is, this is just meant to be, you've got some data, you wanna hand the data around, and then you wanna do a thing. Um, so you can build more interesting things on top of this, and we'll do that uh, in just a bit. Did you have a? Okay. Yeah, um, basically I was just gonna ask to make sure I understand right about scope. It's basically the scope of the closures of the functions you're using in the data flow? There are, it's, um, that is an okay intuition. Um, there are some very concrete things that it requires in terms of um, closing, you know, what, what gets closed over. So um, more particularly, certain things aren't allowed to escape outside of it. Um, but let's, let's, this is more of like a scary rust thing that I, I just, I'm not gonna be able to explain well and more people will have questions and I'll never, yeah. We, well, we can talk later. Um, great, all right. So that, this was a super a super simple example. I'm gonna show you a slightly more interesting one to show you a bit more of the moving parts, um, the things that make timely data flow sort of more interesting than just distributed grep or something like that. Um, so the example gets a bit bigger. Uh, I can't lie to you anymore about certain things. So uh, you know, technically, if I want to make this example work out properly, I'm gonna to need to uh, accept arguments from the, from the command line. I'm, I'm sorry, don't worry about that though, uh, if possible. Um, Here's a, here's a bit of code, which is, this is approximately the same code that we had written in the previous in the previous example. We're just gonna build it up a bit more slowly and a bit more intentionally, and then we're gonna drive it a bit more carefully once we're, once we're done. So rather than call uh, to stream, which we did before, which took some pre-canned data, instead we're gonna call this, this new input uh, thing. The thing that was called scope previously is now called worker. Uh, I'm sorry, I apologize. Um, we're gonna ask uh, for the scope or for this worker to get a, a new input, and an input is a data flow, so, you know, it's a source of data that you know, we can then attach some things on just like we did with the stream. But it comes actually with a, with a second uh, component too, which is a handle outside the data flow that we can force feed data into. Right? It's essentially uh, an adapter between the, the, you know, the real world of our program and the, the data flow world uh, of, of timely data flow. Um, outside of the data flow world, we can just write whatever code we want, but inside the data flow, uh, data flow world, all of the different coordinating workers and processes uh, need to be aware of the data that's moving around and this is why we need a handy little adapter to be able to make sure that as we put data in, everyone agrees that, oh, a thing happened, you know, there's actually data there, we should pay attention, that sort of thing. Um, at the same time, okay, so a lot of this looks pretty similar. There's a to stream, there's an exchange, there's an expect, inspect, that's, that's pretty, pretty similar. Um, the main difference I'd like to call your attention to is this probe operation and let me, um, to explain what probe does, I need to say a few things. So when we invoke this, uh, this data flow method, this was something that was hidden in the previous example. Uh, when, I, when it said example up at the top, the previous thing, it, that was, uh, it would automatically wrap a subcomputation in this data flow. I think this is where we define a new data flow and are, are ready to start, start building it up. What a data flow does in timely data flow is take each piece of data that might move around and attaches a logical timestamp to it. And you can think of this as, you know, real, real uh, time on the wall clock or something like that, or a logical, like a sequence number as, as we move through time. Um, we're gonna be able to drive our data flow and, and move it around through time as we, as we see fit. But part of doing that is deciding what type of timestamp we would like. Uh, this is typically gonna be like an unsigned int or something like that, but could, could be lots of things. And the uh, uh, counterpart to this is this fun little probe operator, which we stick on the end of any data flow stream. Um, it is an operator which 
sort of the dual in some sense of the input. It has two parts to it. It has a data flow component which sees records come in and it has a component that again lives outside of the data flow world and reports back on what timestamps might we still see at this point in the data flow graph. So when we start our computation, uh, the way the times are zero perhaps, we could see uh, records with timestamp zero at this, at this probe and that's um, not too surprising necessarily as once we start, but as we start working uh, with the computation, we start putting inputs into the, into the computation and we start uh, admitting that we're done with certain times, right? If we say, ah, we're done with, we're done with time zero, uh, we would like to eventually learn the moment at which there's no more data bearing the timestamp zero that we'll see at this point in the data flow graph. It's not immediately, right? There'll, there'll be a little bit of time, perhaps, when records with a certain timestamp are still circulating through all of the workers and all the computers and such. But we'd like to very much learn the moment at which, um, or I mean, approximately as soon as we can, when a certain time has evaporated from the system, when we're sure that we're not going to see it again. Cool. So this is sort of the crazy thing that looks as close as possible to control flow, the, the, probe, uh, the probe thing. And I'll, I'll show you how it gets used uh, right now. All right, so whereas previously we just fed the number zero through through 10 uh, into our computation said good luck and sort of walked away. Um, if, let's, we can do this a bit more directly and a bit more carefully now to show you what's going on. So we have each worker walk through each, each round, let's say, this is gonna be like a time uh, round, zero up through 10 as before. We put some data into our input and this is, you know, we, may, we introduce the, the uh, data as data. It'll eventually wander over and, and circulate between all the workers using, using this fun data flow. Whenever, I mean, we, it could happen at this precise moment. It might happen a little bit later once a worker finally picks it up. It's not, uh, it's not guaranteed to happen immediately. Uh, the really exciting thing is that this, uh, this call to advance to is where we now promise that we're not going to send any more data on our input that is not greater or equal to round plus one. So we're, we're advancing the timestamp on this input. We're, we're releasing the capability to send data at any time less or equal to round. And this is a really important part uh, of the computation. This is what's going to allow the distributed collection of workers to eventually conclude that it's safe to tell us uh, in, in the next line um, that we will never see a particular time again at our probe. So, and this is, uh, this is probably like the main important shift between timely data flow and most of the other big data systems that you might be familiar with, the Hadoops and the Sparks and stuff like that. Um, um, the, the control information, the information about progress through the computation, where the collection of workers are with respect to the logical times and stages and such, is in some sense is advisory information. It comes back and we get to see what the current state is at any moment in time. Um, and we can react to that. We can say, well, why don't we just keep doing some work until we make a certain amount of progress? And this, this will end up essentially behaving like a barrier in something like Hadoop or Spark. Um, but we don't have to do that. We could work on other things. We could, we could wander around and we just, we get to notice the progress and react to it as opposed to uh, having a system that fundamentally uh, is structured around a particular execution strategy for the data flow. And this is gonna end up with something that gives us much more of a data flow system rather than just a DAG scheduler, which I would argue a lot of the previous systems are like. All right, is that, so this is, um, I don't wanna belabor the point too much, but if, if everyone's like, ah, oh, whatever, this is, I don't understand that at all, we, sh we might, well, I could say the same words over and over again, but uh, this is definitely, this is like an important moment for the, the timely data flow side of things. There are other important moments too though, so let's, uh, yes, okay. So the workers keep advancing until uh, a certain portion of the inputs uh, is finished processing. Right? Uh, so this this less than this is kind of a guarantee that all timestamps that are seen um, as a result of the data flow, uh, like have been processed up to this input time. Right. So what this is saying for sure, this is a good a good thing to sort of work through for sure is. As long as it's the case that at this point in the data flow graph, we might still see some time that is strictly less than what we're currently thinking is the right time, we should keep working. So we, we imagine if we, if we drain the data flow of everything strictly less than round plus one, 
we're done, we're ready to go on round plus one at this point. And this is essentially asking, you know, keep, keep running until we've successfully drain, uh, drained the data flow. Um, down, is that, okay, yes, but you have a follow-up. Uh, okay. So what, one term I've heard for this is watermark. Uh, but the context that I've heard watermark is actually an estimation. Um, an estimation that we think that no um, events or inputs with a time less than the watermark um, will occur. Yep. Um, whereas this is like a, a more exact execution. Right. So this is for, so watermarks definitely watermarks show up a bunch in stream processing, and they I think I feel like they can have both flavors. Uh, sometimes they can be very exact. Uh, it depends a little on the system. Uh, I get the impression, for example, that Google Cloud Dataflow they're not particularly exact. But in other systems, other stream processes, they're quite exact. Um, th this is very close to, uh, and you could honestly call it a watermark if you like. We're going to do something in the very next transition that is different from all previous stream processors that I'm aware of with respect to the watermark capabilities, though. So maybe I'll do that, and then you'll, you'll, you might have another question. But uh, yeah, Rohan. So let's assume that like PrintLM prints to a file, and everyone prints to the same file. Oh. Would you get like? <laughs> Would all the numbers be in order or not? Um, I don't, so I, okay, if everyone prints to the same file, uh, hopefully we all agree that operating systems are confusing and no one knows what will happen. They'll probably delete your, your um, um, so there'll be no particular guarantees about which worker writes first, right? Um, because within any one round, the workers are uncoordinated other than at this particular moment. Um, they're also slightly coordinated by their data dependencies in that, uh, you know, if, if a worker processes a piece of data and then hands it to another worker, the other worker doesn't do its work until after the first one, uh, you know, clearly. Uh, but no, no particular guarantees about the order, though we hope to see, um, yeah, a whole bunch of zeros, then a whole bunch of ones, then a whole bunch of twos. Because this barrier here doesn't allow the release of the next round of data until all other people have said, I'm completely done with my, uh, with my data. So, so the probe is like the, it somehow quantifies over all workers, not just the current one? It's absolutely, yeah, over all workers. So um, the probe is not smart enough to realize that inspect does not exchange data, for example. You might know that, but but probe is not is not sufficiently bright to realize that. Probe is potentially concerned that out of the operator just above it, there might be reason for data to show up at this particular worker, and it will not uh, say otherwise until it's certain that there's nothing else going on in the system. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, let me let me make this slightly more interesting. Um, not wildly complicated, but we're going to take away the exchange and the, the print line, and we're going to put in something that's sort of fun that uh, the existing stream processors basically fall down on when they try to use um, watermarking, which is an iterative subcomputation. So we have all of our numbers coming in, and we're going to do a thing here, just iterate, and what is it saying? It's, it's saying if you have, uh, it's describing iterative computation in terms of the data flow fragment you should put in the body of the loop and then connect back to itself. Um, it's not so complicated. It says you give me a pile of numbers. I'm going to throw away all the numbers that are not, um, uh, sorry, I'm going to throw away all the zeros, basically. Uh, I'm going to decrement all the numbers by one, and then I'll do an exchange based on the new number. And what this should do is take the numbers, uh, decrement one from them, and then shuffle them around a little bit. They'll go to a different worker now because they have a different number. Uh, it's not a foregone conclusion, but probably going to happen. And what this ends up being is a, is a fairly handy uh, exchange micro benchmark. Right? So if we hand in the number, let's imagine we actually did uh, a million or something like that there. The million number would bounce around between all the workers a million times and then get thrown away. And the amount of time it takes would tell us uh, how good are we at uh, shuffling data around in our computation. And uh, in this case, we're, we're relatively good. Uh, if you do this with just one thread and you look for uh, Essentially, you know, the, the latency of doing one of these iterations. So, you know, we, we take a large number like a billion or something like that. Oh, so a million, imagine. It ends up taking about a second or a few seconds, and, you know, we get sort of microsecond time scale. How long does it take us to go around a cycle with, with some data? And this is the sort of thing that in a system like Spark would be taking hundreds of, of milliseconds. Uh, so you have to go and you have to start up another iteration of a thing with some shufflings of things. Um, so this is a very lightweight... Uh, move data around and coordinate uh, sort of uh, sort of system. The thing that's interesting that's going on here that the stream processors generally fall down on is, um, I don't I don't think I have a slide about this is tracking 
the less than, so doing the probe logic correctly with records that are circulating in some horrible iterative context um, is relatively difficult for um, others, other like non-timely systems to reason about the fact that uh, when the data have completely evaporated from inside a loop, we're done. Uh, we're completely done uh, with that with that iteration. Uh, a lot of the existing watermarking stuff operates by having each of the participants announce to each of the other participants, "Hey, I'm done with I'm done with round uh, 27. Yeah, round 27." Uh, and then they each say, "Great, I've got no data, so I guess I'm done with round 29 or 28. Sorry, whatever comes after 27." Um, and then they go to 29, then they go to 30, then they go to 31, and they just sort of continue indefinitely because no one can actually realize collectively that the, the whole computation is done. Um, that's one of the, the contributions that Timely Data Flow introduces is a different way of tracking progress that allows the system to uh, conclude that, hooray, we're, we're actually done. The probe information uh, will allow us to, uh, to sort of step back and realize the entire subcomputation has, has finished and then we can move on to the next, the next round. Um, some other cute observations. I mean, you know, the time thing, it didn't have to be the input time. It could be input time minus two, and this gives us uh, something that's equivalent to um, bounded, bounded staleness. People are familiar with that. So this allows multiple concurrent iterations to be going on in the data flow at the same time. That's an important part of uh, getting utilization out of your, of your systems. Don't actually have these hard barriers. Just let a few of them bleed over into the next, the next round, stuff like that. All right, I want to show you just a little bit. Um, I'm not going to, in the interest of time, not belabor this too much. Um, we built a few handy, you know, stream on stream uh, computation y things like the map operator, which takes some logic and applies it to each record. That's handy. Uh, you can build these out. This is the actual map implementation in a lower level bit of timely code that you can totally, in principle, write yourself. And I was just going to walk through this and call your attention to some cool Rust things that go on here that make writing uh, efficient but sane code relatively, uh, relatively pleasant. So in writing a timely operator, you need to specify a few things. You need to specify how the data should be exchanged, and for map, it's just a pipeline. You don't need to exchange the data at all. Um, you give it a tasteful, tasteful little name. And then the program, the operator behavior, rather, sorry, is essentially written as a closure. So it's just the inline code you would like to run. Uh, each time we, we kick the operator, imagine we give you a handle to the input and a handle to the output. What should your operator do? And it's not so complicated. I mean, I'll, you can sort of ski from the code if, if you believe that, that this stuff works as intended. You know, you pull data off of the, uh, off of the input, and you, know, you drain, drain whatever data you pulled off, apply the logic, and shove it out to the output. So uh, on the one hand, you know, it's not so complicated. That's nice. It's not 100 lines of code or anything like that. Uh, but there are a few other cool things that go on. Um, depending on what language you're coming from, these are differently awesome. So if you're coming from something like C or C++, Rust insists on destructuring to get access to, to fields, um, and this ensures that you essentially never get access to invalid pointers or anything like that. So if you pull data up, up from the input, it'll either be a valid hunk of data or an indication that there is no data. You don't have to go and check was data valid or not. You can just only get access to the data by, by saying, you know, I'll, I'll match sum of and then time and data, and if that's not what you got back, the, the loop will just drop out and you, and you exit. So it's sort of nice and safe in that, in that way. Uh, you know, the fact that we use a closure here, the logic is, is a closure. Rust is going to go and specialize this all the way down. So it's, you know, sort of analogous to using templates or very aggressive inlining in something like uh, C++. There aren't going to be any function pointers uh, or uh, stuff like that. Yeah, shoot. So if you repeatedly call, I mean, Rust, Rust type system will inherently prevent you from getting bad data back. Um, I guess the point is that to gain access to the data, you have to put the bit of logic in that acknowledges that possibility and make sure that you don't do anything in the case of bad data. So this is this is algebraic data type that will give you back either sum of blah or none. Yeah, in Haskell it's like maybe, yep. A few other things. Uh, ownership is awesome in Rust. I'm not going to be able to convince all of you of how it works, but um, ownership is very much about the resources associated with the data. This is, um, you know, in C++ land, this is like move semantics and, and unique pointers and stuff like that. You know, th this allows you to sanely rash, uh, reason about if I give you a data structure containing strings, for example, and I hand it to you, do you now own the memory backing the strings? Are you allowed to mutate it? Should you be in charge of, of deleting it when, when you're done? 
uh, all of this is just, there's only one way this happens in Rust and uh, it is great. Uh, it means that we get access and ownership to all of the resources. Your function, your logic can assume that it has access to all of the associated resources of the bit of data you're processing. So if you want to take the string and do two caps on it, great, you don't need to do a new allocation or anything like that. You just in place, um, assuming UTF-8 works that way, I don't know, uh, convert everything to uppercase. At the same time, the ownership of the backing buffer here, the thing we drained from, is not transferred, and that's evident in the signature, which you can't really see in the method here, but when you look at what next returns, it doesn't actually give you ownership of the buffer, it gives you a reference to the buffer that you can drain, but you still need to hand memory back, uh, or sorry, leave, leave valid memory in, in place there uh, when you're done. Uh, and this allows for a whole bunch of nice zero copy idioms where you do buffer swapping as opposed to you know, taking ownership back and forcing the other person to keep allocating stuff that it keeps handing to you. Um, it's, all, it's all very nice, uh, I, I think. I like Rust a lot, by the way, I, in case people aren't clear. Um, and I strongly recommend it to anyone who does not understand or has worked with Rust yet. This has made me, a much, in my opinion, a much better programmer. Uh, I used to be a very bad programmer, and I'm now a eh, programmer. So. Um, there's some other things. This is really subtle, but I think really awesome. Um, most of Timely Data Flow is essentially a large distributed capability tracker. Uh, operators have the capability to send data with particular timestamps on them. And we get to observe at other points of the data flow, are there still capabilities in the system that might result in someone exercising a capability locally with a particular time? And the way this is expressed to the programmer is sort of these very simple uh, RAAI style uh, capabilities where you get a capability, you get to hold on to it, and for as long as you hold on to it, you have the capability. If you dispose of it, if you just sort of you know, let it go at any point, you don't successfully keep this in a list and you just let it drop off the stack, its deconstruction will uh, we'll release the capability, you don't have to do any funny business at all, and the system is totally aware of the fact that you've now released the capability, you're no longer able to send a particular piece of data at a particular time. Uh, and you know, as part of this, you need to exercise the capability to actually get access to the ability to send data out along there. So, uh, idiomatically, it's relatively easy to write these sorts of programs that expose you know, fairly sophisticated concepts of your relationship to all the other workers in terms of what data you might send to them along the data flow. Um, and these are, you know, great, some nice things about Rust. Lots of, in my opinion, lots of clarity about, about ownership, lots of clarity about control flow. Uh, it's not a lot of surprising stuff that happens at runtime. And the main thing that I, I like too is it's basically just your code running. There's no runtime under this. Rust is just Rust. Uh, if something crashes, it's your fault. If something's going slow, you can attach a profiler and see what it is and it's your code. Um, I mean, if it's my code, that's, that's too bad, but you know, we, we could have a conversation. It's not Rust though. Um, so that, that's a really nice performance debugging, performance predictability side of things, which I like a lot. All right. I'm gonna transition a little bit and tell you about differential data flow in, in the time remaining. Um, if there are urgent questions about what I just talked about, this would be a good time, but if, if they're not urgent questions, uh, I will introduce new urgent questions in the next section. Good, all right. So, uh, okay, timely, timely data flow lets us let, write lots of different data parallel computation. That's great, but we could use maybe a bit of advice on what types of computations we, we might actually want to write instead of just shuffling data around and, and feeling uh, pleased with ourselves. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, differential data flow, which I've, the subtitle here, I don't really know what to call this, but functional reactive programming at scale is, is maybe a good example um, of what this is. Codes, code's all available, it's based on a cider paper. Um, how many people are familiar with functional reactive programming? Oh, okay, that's more than I expected. So let me, I don't even know if this is functional reactive programming, I'm gonna tell you what I think of it, uh, and and you tell me if, well, don't tell me if I'm wrong, actually. Um, don't tell anyone else if I'm wrong, either. So uh, roughly, one way to look at this is that people are, are not so bad at programming with collections, writing sort of SQL style. Uh, I have a static collection, I wanna tell you how to transform it, and I'm gonna get an output. They're less good at programming with streams because things come in weird orders and, and you gotta remember all sorts of, of stuff to do. So what we'd like to do, at least in this particular project, is give people a, an experience, a programming experience, that is you write a program that pretends like it's acting on static collections. We will uh, then wrap this in a nice way so that you can absorb all sorts of changes to your collections and we will collect, correctly propagate all the changes through the whole data flow and out the other end of the computation emerge all of the corresponding changes to your, uh, to your computation in exact correspondence with the changes to the input, 100% correct answers all the time. Um, and ideally, if you're experiencing relatively 
modest changes to the inputs corresponding to modest changes to the outputs, this all should move pretty briskly because we don't necessarily need to do a lot of work. You know, the intended experience is roughly, roughly like so. You write a program and we're going to pretend that we just walk through all of the times that exist forever and ever and ever and we rerun your program on the input at the time. Yeah, we're not actually going to do this. We're not actually going to rerun your program, but we're going to give you the experience of having your program rerun over and over and over and over again. Great. Well, how is this like stream processing? Well, okay, under the covers what's actually going to happen is all of these collections are going to be streams. And they're going to be streams of triples of data, time, and think about like a signed integer, something like that. So a change in the number of, of occurrences of the record. Uh, Dan, yes. Is there any state um, carried over between D and D plus one? All of these operators are going to be um, functional and deterministic. So no, no. Though, since you're allowed, you, you'll be able to see, since you're allowed to have loops, you'll be able, if you want, to put in a feedback loop. But it has to be explicitly identified as data that you are then feeding back around, and the operators themselves will be stateless. All right, so, uh, so under the covers, all of these collections that might change are going to be streams of, essentially, the logs of the changes to the collections. What changed, at what time, and in what way did it change? So we're, we're only going to be talking about adding and removing and maybe adding multiple copies of, but, you know, adding things to the data. We're not going to talk about, you know, I took a string and I made it a little shorter. That's a, that change would be represented as I used to have a big string, I got rid of it, I added in a new shorter string. Um, so just to get the data model uh, down there. Outputs could be the same, you know, data, times, and changes. All of these things are going to end up nice and composable, so, you know, you write your program, Dan writes his program, we can stick the programs together, the composite program still has this nice structural property that the outputs are always equal to the, the inputs at all times. Well, let me show you an example. Uh, the examples could get progressively more and more complicated, hopefully more and more interesting, though maybe, yeah, we'll see. Um, so, uh, I, I just, this isn't exactly the code you use, but um, what these programs end up looking like a lot are these sort of data parallel SQL style things where you have joins and concats, and I like distinct a lot. Um, but, uh, you know, maybe you could have a count or, you know, various aggregations. But data parallel operators that are relatively simple, we're going to build more interesting programs out of relatively simple bits and pieces. Um, yeah, so in this case, uh, I'm talking about nodes in a graph, and we're going to, we'll walk through the example and we'll bounce a few places, but in this case, the data that we're looking at in the set of, of nodes is a bunch of pairs of uh, a node identifier and a Boolean, true or false. This is going to be, uh, we're going to end up doing reachability. Um, actually, the first, the very first thing we're going to do, if, if you've already read ahead, this computes uh, the folks that are within a one hop neighborhood of the elements of, of nodes. All right, so we have a set of nodes which are just places we can reach in the graph, uh, and we join that with a set of edges. There's a, a match in this join whenever we have an edge from a node that we can reach to, to another edge, and we add that to our set, and so now we have those nodes that we can reach uh, in zero steps and in one steps. Yeah. All right, um, you know, maybe that's interesting. We're gonna make it more interesting. Um, so, uh, let's see, how do I have this rigged? I'm gonna show you first, um, before we get too exciting, I just wanna point out, it is actually a lot like SQL, and you can implement all of CPCH uh, in this framework if you want, and you actually get some pretty sweet numbers. Um, these are comparing throughputs in differential data flow to a, a recent VLDB paper from uh, folks at EPFL, which had, the, the title this is how to, how to win a hot dog eating competition, which just makes it really hard to refer to the title as anything that doesn't involve hot dogs. So uh, this is this hot dog paper over here. And, we see throughput, so we ask how quickly can we absorb updates into a system like this. Um, this is using, I'm using the scale factor one uh, data set. They actually used 10, so you know, they, these numbers aren't really comparable, but my laptop has some issues with the scale factor 10 data set. But you're seeing, you know, on, on the range of sort of, you know, often millions of, of updates per second uh, being absorbed through what in each of these cases is a computation. It's not just like a join, for example. In a lot of these cases we're going, we're computing the maximum revenue by uh, by retailer and then pulling out those retailers with that revenue or you know various other exciting uh, things like that and that's query 15 we're getting you know 13 million tuples a second being pushed through 
such a system where at every moment in time the output is exactly equal to the uh, function applied to the corresponding input. But okay, let's let's make this example a little bit weirder. This was, uh, as I sort of said, this was the one-hop distances uh, in a graph. Let's um, let's do a thing that you can do in differential data flow, and this is sort of unique, as far as I'm aware, to differential data flow. It's not very common. Logic blocks, I think, might be able to do this. Uh, I'd be interested to learn about other systems too. But uh, iterate, just as a as a computational primitive, you can throw into your Computation. This is, if you're a SQL person, this is uh, SQL with recursive, um, SQL 99. But here, this is meant to be meant to be pretty uh, pretty simple, actually. Um, you start from starting from the set of nodes. We iteratively do you know, whatever our reachable set is. Join it with the edges, concatenate in the nodes, do the distinct again, and run this, uh, iterate this forever, basically. Uh, do it until it reaches fixed point, which is going to find all of the nodes that are reachable from whatever we started at. Um, it's interesting, you know, it does a potentially a large amount of work. Um, we, you know, we might reach the whole graph, so that's that's quite a fair bit. And if we change something in the input, we might need to do a fair bit of work. Um, but uh, but it's all, you know, it actually happens and is correct. And I'm going to show you some numbers in, in just a moment. Um, let me first, though, tell you a bit about the the secret, I guess, which is that as we create these like iterative scopes, for example, we start to do funny business with the timestamps. So the timestamps. When we were talking about how do the nodes and edges change, these outer collections, they just had a time attached to them, which might have been you know, seconds or something like that. As we dive into this nested iterative scope, we enrich the timestamps with an additional field, which is going to intuitively correspond to the round of iteration. And all of the logic we end up doing with respect to incremental computation is all with respect to a weird partial order, rather than uh, probably what you were thinking was going to happen. So this is all very exciting and exotic, and there's no way I'm going to be able to explain operationally how this works. But it's cool to learn about, and if people want to know more, I'm happy to eventually say more. Um, but this lets us do really neat things, which I'm going to I'm going to show you some numbers now. Uh, so this is these are numbers from uh, the big data log paper at Sigma 2016, uh, where they evaluated a few systems. Uh, yeah, Graphic Socialite, uh, Myria, and and big data log. Uh, we also evaluated a few of these, and Myria had the awesome property that of all the things we evaluated, it was the only one that gave correct answers. <laughs> um, uh, some systems, after after a bit of work with Socialite, corresponding with the folks down at Stanford, we eventually got their system in a state where it no longer gave answers. Uh, they, at least they, they weren't incorrect anymore. Um, so, excellent. Um, all right, so, so these th this is a paper someone else wrote. They, they have their data sets. Uh, we just grabbed them and uh, tried to use them. Um, they did some evaluation, and you know I did the standard like hooray! Here's differential on my laptop. Uh, it does the same computations in times that are relatively uh, relatively modest on you know one or two cores. Moreover, uh, it leaves us in a situation where we can go and we can change the inputs. So we can take these various graphs and like randomly pull an edge out, for example. And within about 50 microseconds, uh, we can have the correct updated reachability set come out the other end. Uh, so that's that's sort of handy. Um, at least I think it's pretty cool. Uh, this is a, a complementary cumulative CDF of the amount of time each of these updates took. So I went and I did a thousand random updates to these to these graphs, and you can sort of see that in this case, about 40% of the examples changed changed nothing. This is a redundant edge that didn't actually change the reachability in, in the graph. You know, six, the, most of the rest of them do something that take you know tens to hundreds of microseconds. And there's one loser time out there that took more than a, a millisecond. It took about 20 milliseconds actually, which is a good point. You know, to point out that there's no magic here. If, if we actually go and like rip one of the edges really close to the the root of the thing we're doing reachability from, yeah, a lot of the computation changes. Um, you know, we can't. We're not going to magically make that go any faster. We're only going to repair the computation. There are maybe better things you could do uh, specifically for reachability, but we're going to go and fix the program that you wrote rather than. Uh, try to be too smart. I, I didn't, I didn't yeah. Paper, uh, uh, sorry, what about logic blocks? Uh, it seems like they would be interesting on that table. They, they would be. I, I apologize. I only stole the numbers from the big data log paper. Um, when, when we've evaluated logic blocks in the past, we've been consistently faster than it, though at the same time, logic blocks is a real product that doesn't, you know, we're not allowed to dive into the code and change stuff in logic blocks anytime I realize I can get 10% more. So, one of the things you realize when writing, you know, bigger systems is that you have, at some point you have to be a grown-up and admit that um, 
although you can get a little bit faster for one figure, uh, if your goal is to actually ship something to other people and then go on holiday for a month, uh, you, you don't want random bits of code that you forgot about. And so the logic box guys, they were actually they were super helpful in uh, another project they were working on them with. Um, we, we, definitely, we came out ahead in that case, though we gave ourselves lots of advantages in terms of uh, how long are we willing to iterate on our code versus iterate on their code. So, but I, I like their work a lot. In case anyone wants to tell me anything about Logic Box, I will listen to pretty much anything people will tell me. Um, I will not go to Atlanta, though, because it's too hot. Uh, just so, some, more, some more interesting information. This is sort of part of the directions of future research here, which is that as we look at a single update, okay, a single update, 50 microseconds, that's cool. What happens if we, that was with, with one worker, 50 microseconds. What happens if we start adding in more workers? Eh, nothing good, right? Like if, if we just do one update, there's not really a lot of parallel work to do. So um, that sucks. Things generally get slower. If we throw in 1,000 updates at a time, uh, having multiple workers definitely improves the situation. We get about a 2x uh, improvement across the board, which is pretty, uh, pretty tasty. Uh, you know, we, we like that a lot. Uh, you might also, you can't really see it, but the 20 millisecond thing went down to, to 10 milliseconds. Um, but what this is telling us, and I'll, I'll call attention to this again in just a, just a slide or two, we'd really like to be in this regime over here. I mean, we really, although we're working with single, like these very high resolution updates, we'd like to be in a situation where adding more and more workers scales, right? So doing single updates at a time is cute, but we really don't want to end up in that, that situation unless we only have one or two things to do. We don't, we don't want to take a thousand updates and parcel them out one at a time because then our you know, 128 cores or whatever don't actually help us. All right, uh, a few more examples just real quick. If we change the distinct and such to be uh, argmin, we get graph connectivity. This is a label propagation for graph connectivity algorithm. The big data log people looked at that too. Um, and uh, then, you know, sort of as, as you'd expect, I guess. Um, cool. Let me, I'm gonna wind down with, this is, I guess, in a previous life, this would have been open problems or future directions or something. This is basically what I'm working on right now, uh, which as opposed to like what I would like you to believe I'm gonna work on. Um, so this is all, the first three of these are live at the moment, and the fourth one is sort of in, in development. Um, it's important as you run these things that the, the actual underlying data, uh, you know, you run for a week, the underlying data should uh, get compacted. You should not grow without bound uh, your underlying representation. Yeah, I used to do that, doesn't do it anymore. Uh, I didn't have to tell you that, but I thought I, I uh, thought I would. Um, the system is now, uh, high throughput and high resolution, or it's, it's keyed at high throughput, high resolution uh, in the time domain, as opposed to high throughput, low latency. So what this, what this means is that we work really hard on keeping the fidelity in the, under, in the input timestamps. So if, if the input timestamps are sourced in nanoseconds or something like that, we're gonna produce outputs that are sourced in nanoseconds. So we're not actually gonna run them, uh, or be able, certainly be able to run them at nanosecond timescales, uh, but we will make sure that we involve as many workers as possible uh, concurrently, so large batches of many, many, many distinct nanosecond times so that, um, so that our first coping strategy for an overload situation is not changing the computation, coarsening it or something like that. It is just doing more aggressive batching without, without damaging the, the results. This is really important if you're in like finance or something like that where you can't just um, oh, I don't, you know, my compliance is, is, you know, I check it every 27 minutes or something like that. You, you really want to know what's actually going on at each moment to know if uh, you're in compliance. And the final thing that I think is really cool, I haven't seen any other streaming systems, and people should tell me if I'm just crazy here or not, is very aggressive, uh, differential airflow now does very aggressive sharing and reuse of internal uh, structures. So in a database, if you use the same relation multiple times, you would, be doing index reuse, right? You'd index the data once, you would use it multiple times. If I write a computation, like a graph computation that does some of this reachability crud, um, and then reuses the collection of edges somewhere else, like maybe I, this is a join with the edges just as a lookup, basically I gets the neighbors of some nodes, and maybe I do a two hop lookup sort of thing. In most uh, data flow processors that I'm familiar with, uh, and indeed, you know, differential until relatively recently, there'd be a copy of the graph at each of these operators. Right, each of these joins would say, I need to join a stream of, I don't know what, against against the edges, so 
I just keep an indexed form of all these edges around. And that's the same thing to do if these operators, instances of these operators are distributed crazily throughout your, throughout your cluster. There's no particular reason to think that you might be able to otherwise find the data uh, at hand. Uh, differential does something different, which insists that each of these operators uh, are partitioned. Uh, they're partitioned on the same key using the same partitioning function. So each of the instances of each of these operators can always find the data that they need uh, locally. And indeed, we, we changed the program a little bit to say step one, before you ever use interesting index data, step one, push it through this arrangement operator, which puts together an index, puts together and maintains an index representation of all the data, which then gets shared and reused by all of the operators that need this pile of data indexed by this particular key. So this means that, you know, although we're using edges a whole bunch of times, there's really just one instance of this collection in the entire cluster. So we can, you know, arbitrarily add more computations here using this uh, edges relation in this indexed form without any additional memory footprint, anything like that. In the same way that if you fire up another query on your database, if you can use as many relations as you want, you're not going to have to copy them over and use, you know, redistribute them across your, your data, your, your cluster or anything like that. So this is really cool. I'm, I'm excited about pushing, this is, I'm basically done, sorry, I should say. Um, but the sort of next direction is pushing on this and trying to turn this into something like a stream processing equivalent of a DBMS, something that uh, maintains all of these indexed streams uh, that correspond to materialized collections at various, various points in time, lets you write computations that look like, you know, SQL stuff with, with iteration, I guess. Um, and then just works as a very aggressive, very efficient incremental view maintenance algorithm. So you, all of your queries are standing queries that are kept accurate to within, you know, sort of millisecond uh, tolerances and stuff like that. Um, I don't know, it, it seems like it has a whole bunch of potential to really rethink how we do data management in the stream, uh, in the stream setting. But I'm going to stop there. Um, uh, let me let me at least throw up all of the URLs and stuff like that at the end. Um, boom, boom, boom. So uh, they all just you can go to github.com slash Frank McSherry. This is one of the nice things about being unemployed is that like you don't have a web page, and so you realize that like I'll just put all my stuff on GitHub, and that's how people can learn about me. And yeah, if people are interested in any of this. Uh, it's, you know, it's all open sourcey type stuff. Collaboration is great, uh, I think. Um, you can also read about my opinions on big data processing stuff. Some of those opinions are also great. Uh, I, uh, you get more of those charts that I showed you with uh, other people's stuff. But, but I'll, I'll stop there. I think I appreciate everyone for the time and I apologize for running over uh, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, but everyone who doesn't want to ask questions should be more than comfortable leaving and doing whatever it is you need to do next. We will follow his advice and do whoever wants to leave. Uh, if you think to leave, let's be, we should take questions. And actually, I, I have a question. Oh, dear. So, in, in your programming language, apparently the semantic is not deterministic. So, if these messages that I'm sending all over to the server, uh, if they arrive in various intended orders, then the semantics of the output might actually depend on the order in which the messages arrive, which is quite different from what we know in Spark, for example, or in you know, the SQL. So, let me, let me draw a distinction. This is a, you're, you're right about, you're, you're right in part. So at the timely data flow layer, sort of the operating system part, non-determinism uh, non absolutely happens. Um, uh, you can write operators that behave differently based on how the system under, actually schedules the data, data movement and stuff like that. The implementations, unless I have bugs, the implementations of the differential data flow operators are, um, they have deterministic semantics. Right? Their behavior may be non-deterministic in the sense that they may produce the resulting diffs in different orders potentially, but they will be 100% uh, determined from the input sequence of, of diffs. Um, yeah, if, if you were in a situation where the time was in fact totally ordered, it would produce exactly uh, a deterministic sequence of, of outputs. Then I misunderstood the semantics. You're saying the semantics is deterministic. The differential data flow semantics, uh, yes, are the input and output semantics. The execution itself can be non-deterministic in the sense that I might receive these diffs in funny orders, but the implementations of the operators are the, such that most of them will say, before I process time t, I need to wait until I'm sure that I've received everything for time t. Then I will put it in a canonical form. I will, I will go and ship things. In fact, the whole, like the durability side of things is very much predicated on deterministic 
uh, functional semantics where we can treat essentially everything as append-only logs of, of changes and recover at any point in time by just grabbing whatever we have around from that log, directly putting it into play and, and starting to work again. But yeah, uh, differential data flow, deterministic, timely data flow, uh, no. The guarantees with respect to the coordination, uh, the, the probing and the progress and stuff like that, but that's the only, only guarantee it ensures. Yes? My question is kind of similar to Dan's. So basically, the timing data flow layer, you like to the first of approximation, to me, is more like a, a, let's say, a map reduce, but however, with an asynchronous execution, and you can, through doing uh, clever things over different time stamps and different like, numbers of iterations, right? So then you kind of compile the uh, differential data flow to the timing data flow. I guess here, uh, the essential part is that, uh, like, we need someone like as clever as you to you. compile the uh, differential data flow so to the uh, timing data flow, and uh, that seems pretty hard in general. And uh, I guess you are, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm guessing you are trying to utilize some like domain-specific uh, properties. For example, uh, the uh, the monotone monotonicity of some. There's, so you're right that differential data flow is complicated, and that I imagine no one would want to be the person who has to sit down and, like, as a class project, implement a new differential data flow operator. It's, it's annoying. They're not, you know, they're like hundreds of lines of code, not thousands or anything like that. But they're, they hurt your brain for sure. Though I, I would say that most of it is, is brain hurting with respect to things like the partial orders and stuff, as opposed to the interface with the timely data flow layer. Most of that actually ends up being pretty simple. It's, it's typically grab data from the inputs. Look at the times. If you see a time, make sure to wait for it before you act on what you see. So like, that that part of the code is pretty concise, and, and, and like operator logic generally is, is pretty concise. We've written several different other non-differential data flow programs, and I've had people who are not me write timely data flow programs. Um, the people at, at ETH in Zurich have been writing, and they've had access to me in the past, but they've been writing their own now programs. It's it's a good question. I mean, it's, it's more complicated than MapReduce for sure. Um, is a good question of, okay, we gave you some more rope. It's enough rope to hang yourself. Is it useful rope, though? And, you know, maybe should it be less rope, or should it be rope with, like, a, a careful protective knob on the end or something? I don't know. Okay. Yeah. The question here would be uh, sort of, like, what, because you try to try using your language, yeah. how, how can I express my own, like, application-specific problem in, in your language? Uh, okay. Yeah, no, it's a good question. To, I mean, it's the sort of thing that, you know, having a sit-down and talking through, um, the, with timely data flow, the goal is definitely increase the level of expressivity, um, for sure, with the hope that what you end up with is something that actually runs well and doesn't look like a bunch of scripts wrapped around MapReduce jobs. Like, if you need iterative computation, how do you, you know, if you, and you only have MapReduce, what do you, you probably either, like, try to fix the system, you, you do Haloop or something like that, or you write a bunch of scripts that do some horrible mess, and now you have two problems rather than one problem. But it is a good question. Uh, how easy is it to port your own stuff to it? Yeah, shoot. Can you talk a little bit more about the magic of partial orders? Uh, <laughs> sure. Um, it's, uh, I can talk at arbitrary length about it. I'm, I'm a little worried that I'm not going to be able to convince you that. So the, the, rough, the rough idea is that typically when we think of doing incremental computation, mo most people think of totally ordered time and that there's a sequence of changes that happen to a collection. Right? Uh, and in that case, you, it's not too tricky to, to write an operator that says, oh, if I see a sequence of changes to a thing, I will, you know, apply my function at each of the times and I'll produce the corresponding sequence of changes to the output. Um, this becomes really complicated with iteration, especially with stuff like, uh, like reachability, for example, where if you uh, put all the times in an order, so you say, okay, I can reach this node and now I'll do a few rounds of iteration. I can reach some more nodes. I can reach more nodes. Ray, I can reach a lot of nodes. If you delete that first node now that was what led to everyone being reachable. If you only move forward from this point, you will never realize that you should have unraveled the entire computation. So what you, this isn't the only way you could do it, but one way that is sufficient to un unravel all this mess is to have times, so have the next time that you work on um, not come after all these other changes that you apply, but sort of come a little bit, a little bit before, uh, in, in essence. Where the nice thing that, that happens is as you move forward in the reevaluation from this, this new time, you can just borrow a lot of the previous diffs that happened. 
Um, so instead of rederiving everything, you can look and say, ah, I, apparently the times now allow me to fold in this change in the second iteration, the change in the third iteration. Uh, there's one paper I'm familiar with, with data log repair uh, that actually does something similar to this, but in my experience, uh, incrementally updating data log evaluation is not something that anyone really other than logic blocks does particularly well. Um, it is not like DRED, if you're familiar with that, um, is like one of the more famous data log repair algorithms. Uh, yeah, sorry. I don't, I don't have a lot of good analogies for like where has this existed before, so uh, maybe with talking with people I'll, I'll find more. Do you, do you, do you know of any thing like partially? Or? That was the hot dog thing up there. That, you know. um, that, that's uh, <laughs> no, it's yeah. They handle nested queries, which correspond to staged queries in like a data flow graph. And their I think their main complaint is that you have to manually write them out in something like this, as opposed to taking them from a nested SQL statement and automatically inferring the um, the, the data flow structure. When I've talked with him, that's what they've said. Yes. Um, sorry, I have no background with Rust, but uh, would you would it be possible to write some sort of Spark backend based on your your framework? Something that I could take my Spark code, my Spark backend code, as uh, not the Spark frontend code, and simply replace uh, original or the current Spark engine with something based on what you are doing. It's hard to say. I mean, a lot of Spark is uh, Java and Scala, and a lot of the, I mean, at the highest level, if, if there really was a nice high-level language that people had used uh, when they were using Spark, so you know, Spark SQL or something like that, in principle, yes. Um, and the Spark um, uh, link style things where they, they have collections and such like that where you write your programs, in principle, one could imagine rewriting those into this type of, uh, this type of language. The Spark people will tell you uh, you should be using tungsten. Tungsten is, you know, a, Pencilly recompiling all of your code into something that's probably like what LLVM is doing to the Rust code. Um, yeah, I mean, in principle, in principle, yes. Uh, this is strictly more expressive than Spark. Uh, I don't see a business opportunity in, uh, you know, doing tech support for Spark. Um, but, but yeah, conceptually, like from a research point of view, yes, like the. There's no particular reason you shouldn't be able to slot something like this in behind Spark. They would complain, I think, that the fault tolerance story here is, is a bit crap. I would say that Spark only crashes because you need 100 times as many computers. You know, we, we, can, we can sort that one out. Uh, yeah. Following up on that point, uh, I think one is in a big data system, you have a scheduler that can handle failures, that can handle stragglers, and you can do it. Family that compiles everything to binaries and just runs those binaries. So there's, there's no program that knows about the whole set of code. That's true. The question is, uh, is about nested data. Would that be something? Nested data, like nested data parallelism, or what? What is nested data? So let's say we have a, a big collection of JSON files, uh, which, are, which are nested, and then uh, maybe from a single execution we spawn executions for each sub object we set in. It's the sort, I think in this context, the, so there's a, a re, line of research called nested data parallelism that sort of shows up in Haskell and stuff like that, which is largely about can you take computations that look like um, either recursive or, or nested computations and flatten them. So can you replace each of these, uh, if all of these JSON spawned computations are identical, you can in principle uh, extract a tag from each of the JSON objects and push all of the data uh, tagged with that, that tag through the same common data flow. So instead of spawning up a million subcomputations that all do approximately the same thing, you have a million times as much whatever data as you're going to send around, but just clearly tagged so they don't interfere with each other as they're moving through the data flow. Does that make sense? Or um, something that's easily supported, you would have to add it from the outside. Um, yeah, like it would involve right, making sure your program could be rewritten as a data parallel. Um, so the thing that you sp if the thing you spawn looks like uh, data parallel mumble like this, um, it's a pretty easy transformation. It's just every, every key in your your computation you glom on the you know, whatever unique identifier you had for your JSON document, and now all of the subcomputations only match also when the key 
uh, that that uh, identifier is, is the same. Um, it's not for free, like it's not a magical thing that automatically happens for you, but it's also, it's not a massively complicated thing to do. It's the sort of thing, I mean, you could totally imagine, you know, a, a medium scale research project, like how should we write our programs to do this automatically? Um, and you would get substantial performance benefits over something like Spark where you end up spawning a million uh, subcomputations that then need to be managed by the, the central scheduler. And then my next question about that scheduling or handling failures. You're, you're absolutely correct that none of these things are addressed in the system at the same time it has yet to ever have been a problem. Um, it, it's an interesting trade-off. So like realistically, so in a, in a batch computation setting, fault tolerance and skew management and stuff, these are strictly performance optimizations. These are about making your computation finish faster. Okay. And if your computation takes one-tenth the resources because it doesn't include infrastructure to manage all of these things, um, that is a plausible rebuttal to do we actually need these things in the first place. I mean, we can debate at that point whether they're actually important or not. More importantly, I think in a streaming system that's meant to be online, you know, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not having a fault tolerance story is a bit crap. Uh, so I, I definitely feel bad about that. Um, but yeah, questions like, like elasticity, for example, in the stream setting, typically you don't think in stream processors about dynamically adding in more resources um, because that's a very expensive thing to do and there's a, a really big hiccup when that happens. Um, instead, you think about load shedding style tactics or uh, time coarsening type tactics that let you increase the throughput at a degraded accuracy, something like that. Um, you can ask these questions. They're good questions to ask for sure. Um, I, I don't have any particular answers and I wanted to be very clear that I don't feel particularly bad about that. <laughs> but, uh, but no, it's good to ask and, and to complain about, about the lack of them. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's time. Frank is going, going to be around there this evening.